by From the Core readers. We are going to read another chapter of From the Core. I'm just going to shift around a little bit. Um, and I just want to remind you, I'm coming to you from the Mediterranean coast in a little city in Italy, a little town in Italy called Anzio. It's right on the Mediterranean. And um, it's beautiful. I'm looking out over the Mediterranean, but I do want to remind you that we are outside. So you are going to hear a little bit of traffic noise, possibly a Vespa passing by. My neighbor speaking Italian, She she's out having tea and enjoying the, the ocean as well. So you may hear a little bit of that. But I started and stopped making this a couple of times and decided it's okay if you hear a little bit of that noise. It's a little bit of the part of the Italian life and, and consequently a part of the story. So we're going to dive in together. This is chapter 16 called Body and Soul. Seattle, summer 2016. Memorial Day was sunny and bright, but I wasn't. The end of May had been Lumen's due date. I had continued to clock time around her. Conception, heartbeat, miscarriage, due date. When she had formed, I had bonded. I walked into my living room and looked at the small urn bearing the remains and the engraved stone I had made as a headstone. Instantly, I had this thought. What if I let go? I thought about her every day. I never got to see her fully formed face, kiss her tiny feet, play with the head of curls she undoubtedly would have had, or blow bubbles on her tummy. I had held her in my hand, but never held her sweet little hand. And still, she brought me life. In the months that followed the miscarriage, I had begun weekly saline infusions, and within a month, my life had been restored. Apparently, the trauma to my brain and resulting nervous system had caused a malfunction in maintaining blood volume. The symptoms of blood volume loss included everything I'd become so familiar with, the relentless nausea and profound fatigue, the most life-draining ones. Lumen's departure pointed a big arrow to a treatment plan that got me up out of bed and back into life in a way that I had long stopped hoping for. I heard her name a year later from one of my nurses in passing. Inserting an IV in me was not an easy task, and the nurses frequently had to make three or more attempts. They would successfully insert the catheter in the vein, but for some reason my veins would clamp down around the tube, blocking the flow of water. It was frustrating and confusing for the nurses and painful for me. We weathered it together with humor and grace, and I would do slow and deep breathing and encourage them along. The nurses had a protocol that if they tried twice and were unsuccessful, they would bring in another nurse to try again. Sometimes they stayed and kept trying, but most of the time they brought in another nurse, a fresh start for us both. I knew all the nurses by name and over time also came to know the stories of their lives. Karen had made two attempts at my veins when Susan came in to offer relief. What's going on? Susan asked. You trouble again, lady? She asked with a laugh. I shrugged and smiled an apologetic smile. Same as always, Karen said, getting up off the stool and letting Susan sit down. I successfully get it in the lumen, but then her veins clamped down. I waited until I got home to look up the definition. Lumen, an opening, the cavity of an organism, vessel, or cell, the hollow of a needle or catheter, the space through which water flows. I marveled at the coincidence that the very name we chose in 30 seconds or less, having no idea of its secondary definition or reason to believe at the time it was anything special or significant, was precisely the name that held both my hope and my healing. Lumen was the beacon for my healing, and her name carried the healing methodology. When we first chose the name, I looked at it one way, but in this new light, her, lame, her name became something else entirely. I had come to know this as the beauty of healing. It is both pleasure and pain, darkness and light, a prism refracting light differently at the advent of each new day. I walked to the edge of Green Lake and sat down in the sun. I watched the water dance for a long time. I thought about Lumen as the sun lay on my face. I felt the weight of the rock and turned it over and over in my hands. In it, on it read, you were here. We saw your heart. As I sat quietly by the water, I dug a small hole with a broken off branch. When it was deep enough, I slipped the small square urn inside and moved the earth over top of it. This would be her place of rest. 
I stood up and dusted off the rear of my shorts in order for me to move forward, in order for me to live into the life her life made possible. I had to return it all to dust. I held the stone to my mouth and whispered these simple thoughts. You were born November 18th, 2013. I held you in my hand. Your name is Lumen. I am your mom. From this day forward, the life I live is your legacy as much as it is mine. I arched my arm back and let the rock fly. There is no greater power than the acceptance of loss. Teresa, journal number 17. I wasn't just taking authority of my healing. I was grabbing it by the horns. I engaged Josie Rice, a local Seattle artist and, a, and graphic designer to help me design elements for the healing kit and spent $10,000 bringing it to life. I had no plans for what to do with it, but when I heard, they're not yours to keep, they're yours to give away, I felt internal pressure to action it. I'd made 100 boxes and began giving them away. I became rigorous in looking for signs where I had clamped down around my pain and did everything I could to open the flow. I wasn't sure how long I'd been doing it or when it started, but the moment it came into my awareness, I was clear it needed to stop. I had been showering with the lights off. For years, I had been at war with my body so deep I had developed a disregard for my flesh. It wasn't so much that I hated my body, I would stopped acknowledging it even existed. It was a systemic problem. I had become numb. Physically, my dysautonomia had impacted my nerve endings and robbed me of a lot of physical sensations. I didn't feel hunger, I didn't experience thirst, and when I worked out, I had no indication of waning energy until the floor dropped out. Emotionally, I had also become numb to the signals my soul was sending, perfecting the out-of-body experience or cheerleading my way through emotional pain. If you protect what you value, I didn't value a body that couldn't be relied upon, a body that had tortured me from the inside out. Consequently, I hadn't protected it from the outside, which meant I let danger in and ignored it when it came. My body and I had separated long ago. Shutting off the lights was tantamount to divorce. When people are acutely uncomfortable or desperate for new life, they often talk of shedding their skin. If shedding was rejecting, I had done that. But if I was going to step into a wholeness of being, if I was going to be responsible for healing myself, I needed to find a way to put that skin back on, accept it, and somehow learn to embrace it once again. A woman I met at Melody's Urban Campfire event had posted a picture on Facebook of a boudoir photo shoot she had done for her husband for their anniversary. It was discreet and her body looked beautiful. I thought maybe through another's lens, I might be able to see my body anew. The boudoir photographer Dana and I met at a coffee shop in Ballard and quickly bonded when I shared with her how I had detached from my body. She had struggled with her body too. Well, you look great was always the response I received when someone was shocked to learn the state of my health. It was meant as a compliment, but only served to make me feel even more invisible. I was hoping with the click of the camera lens, I might show up. Where do you want to do it? Dana asked. Do you have a great bedroom or hotel in mind? The idea of shooting my skin reclaiming moment in a bed, the seat of my physical torture and years of isolation caused a stricture in my throat. No, Dana, I said in a warm rush of panic spreading up my neck. It can't be inside. She knew just the place. She showed me a shoot she had done outside in the mud flats of Moses Lake and very close to Vantage, the halfway point between my, the home of my parents and the new life I was building in Seattle. I liked the symbolism of the halfway point, halfway between death and life, halfway between healing and embodying wholeness, in the middle of transition, covered in mud, a molten hot mass of forming new life. It was the perfect spot. We would go there, and as planned, we would shoot by the light of the full moon at midnight. We drove out to Moses Lake and shot a few images in the mud flats and sand dunes at high noon. It was sweltering hot, and if I started out clean and shiny, I ended up dirty and wet. 
As Dana wrapped up her gear to move our, to our next location, I leaned against the hood of my Jeep, mud streaked on my arms and thighs and caked in my hair. I breathed out against the heat. My Jeep had always felt like freedom and shooting my body outside felt like freedom indeed. I showered and we spent the evening in separate yurts. Around midnight, Dana came calling and we slipped out into the night. We took no lights with us and walked quietly into a field that we had scouted on arrival. It was a wide open plain surrounded by vineyards on three sides and a road on the other. We were hoping no cars would pass by. The ground was dry and hard, the topsoil thin, dusty and unforgiving. I thought briefly about snakes. We found a spot that caught the moonlight and Dana set her camera down. I opened up my gold star scarf, draped it over the harsh ground and stretched myself across it and lay naked in the dark. The thinness of my scarf was little protection and brittle grass poked up out of the compressed earth through the scarf and dug into me. I pressed my body into it, wanting to feel the earth even if it delivered pain. I lay looking up at the sky aware of Dana's gaze, but ever distancing. The night air was careful and warm. It whispered over my body like the downstroke of a song. The moon hung swollen and low. I could see her craters, and in the dark of night, I showed her mine. Here I would lay down my pain. Here I would press my body into the earth. Here I would lift my throat to the heavens and open my voice against the roar of the sky. Here I would embrace that I was made of shattered stars and let their light litter over my physical offering. Here I would accept that my body was a vessel made of earth and filled with the heavens. There was no distance, no space between. We were, every last one of us, one. One with heaven, one with earth, made of dust, filled with song. You are loved by the creator of the universe beyond comprehension. Teresa, journal number 19. Dana and I sat in front of her computer screen in her apartment a few days later. She gave me a moment to prepare myself for what was about to come. Are you ready? She whispered quietly in the tones of excitement and anticipation. I nodded and braced myself. I allowed the images to lift off the screen and make their way into me coaching myself to enlarge the opening. I forced my way past any critique of my body and found my way to its beauty. The twist in my wrist, the curve of my thigh, the lift of my neck, the length of my arm. In the end, I found the, myself the most fully in two images, one predictable, one surprising. The first was of me standing in the moonlight before I had laid myself out on the ground. The moonlight rinsed over the contours of my face. Its harsh light cut contrast to the peace that was within, self-evident in the tilt of my head and the ease behind my closed eyes. The scarf, gold and flowing, stretched out on both sides, arms open wide. Behind me, way off in the distance, six miles away, were the red lights of a few cars, night owls on the road, lights on my runway as I, a winged eagle, prepared to take flight. The second image I turned away from the moment it popped up. No, Dana, no, I yelled horrified. She coked my, coaxed my hands down and had, that had flown up and covered my face. I had been so emboldened when we captured the shot, brazen, trailblazing, fierce and free. It was high noon in the desert. The sun was overhead. It was white hot heat, unmerciful and unrelenting. And rushing forward like a semi on the highway, my thighs clapping thunderously, my forehead tilted forward, my eyes squinted against the sun, right down the center line, naked and unashamed, I came barreling down. I left in his house and embraced these truths. I was an energetic body and a spiritual being. I was made of dust and infused with divinity. In response to healing and heartache and loss and life, I would take it head on, naked and unashamed. I would embody this vessel given to me and in it, come what may, I would come barreling down. <laughs>